What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where on every episode I'm always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And on this episode, we're continuing on through Liturgy 101, but not where we're supposed to. We're talking about an alternate, we're talking about the hymn of praise, but not the Gloria. We're talking about Worthy is Christ. Stick around. So we've been going through the liturgy piece by piece. We've been relying occasionally on a video that's about 10 years old uh, of when I was conducting uh, a Lutheran worship service in my Lutheran worship class in my days at Concordia University when I was majoring in theology and pastoral ministry and minoring in biblical languages and all sorts of fun things that never ever came to fruition. But I digress. So we've gone through confession and absolution and we've gone through the intro it and we've gone through the curie now we come to a part of the service called the hymn of praise and traditionally in the church for centuries this has been uh glory be to god on high and to on, on earth peace good well let's just take a look so we're relying on divine service setting. Well, yeah, glory to God in the... Oh, okay. see, I was thinking divine service setting three. But we're working through divine service setting one because it's kind of the base. Uh, <laughs> divine service setting three, my favorite. But uh, we're going through divine service setting one. So glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth uh, is what the pastor would chant. And then the people would sing, Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you. But yeah, we'll get to that. This is the hymn of praise, the Gloria in Excelsis. But I want to talk about the alternate hymn of praise, This is the Feast, or more commonly known as Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain. This is an alternate hymn of praise, and I want to talk about the alternate first because as I've been going through this Liturgy 101 series with the intent of teaching why Lutherans do this, because I've said it before, I'll say it again. When I was young and growing up and all my friends went to those charismatic churches that looked more entertaining, and I asked, why are we doing this? Well, we're Lutherans. We've always done it that way. That is a stupid answer. That is a stupid answer. And every Lutheran who says that to a youth, I want you to look at your hand and then smack the hell out of your face for saying it. It's a Dumb answer. Don't ever give that answer. We do what we do as Lutherans because it is biblical, because it is vitally important, because it is our history and it is our heritage, because it confesses Christ and him crucified and actually gives us Christ and him crucified. There are a plethora of reasons why Lutherans worship the way we worship, and they are all worth talking about. But I don't want this whole series to be just some diatribe on why we should have the historic liturgy of the church. So rather than going, first we do confession and absolution, then we do this, then we do that, now we're at the hymn of praise. This alternate hymn of praise, the worthy is Christ, gives us an opportunity to really talk about what liturgy is and what it isn't. And in the process, I'm probably going to piss off a lot of Lutherans. But that's okay. Uh, by by a lot of Lutherans, I mean the ones who are like, if it's not in the Lutheran hymnal, I'm not doing it. That crowd. Okay. <laughs> if the Lutheran hymnal is good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. That crowd. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of the Lutheran service book. I find the Lutheran hymnal absolutely amazing. And I was brought into the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod on Lutheran worship. So I get to enjoy the best of all of them. That's that's what I get as a Lutheran. So we've made Confession. And we've done the intro, which is God's word, usually a psalm or, or even on occasion, maybe even something from the Apocrypha. <gasps> and then we have the Kyrie, Lord have mercy. So now, having confessed our sins, having heard a little bit of the word of God, which is going to give us the focus for the day, and again, crying out to the Lord for mercy, what, what else can we do except for rejoice and sing a hymn of praise that God is merciful. And traditionally in the church, that has been the Gloria in Excelsis, the words of the angels uh, at Christmas expanded upon. But around the early 1900s, and this, this alternate hymn of praise is tricky to nail down. So around the early 1900s, so very, very late in Christendom, 
we get this canticle, this, this, these lyrics. I think it was the 70s, 1970 is when we get this beautiful hymn of praise, worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain. And the, 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 the Lutherans went nuts for it. Lutherans were kind of, we're like the frozen chosen, you know, like we're just, (laughs) With, or as my grandfather likes to refer to us, those frigid Lutherans. We're co- even in my own church. My gosh, you know how irritating it is to sit in church on Sunday, on Easter, singing uh, at the Lamb's High Feast we sing, and everybody's just kind of mumbling it. But you want a hymn that's going to wake Lutherans up and get them all sorts of excited and get them projecting worthy is Christ. That hymn of praise, Lutherans went nuts for it. And that's why I want to talk about this one first, because this is going to help us focus on what the liturgy is. The liturgy is a living, breathing thing. And it's a living, breathing thing, because at least in the Lutheran tradition, it is fed by the word of God. And the word of God is a living and active word. So if the word of God is living and active and our liturgy is the word of God, then our liturgy is living and active. And if it's living and active, then yes, it's subject to grow. The best analogy that I've ever heard for the liturgy of the church is that it's a tree. It's living, it's active, it's growing. And occasionally it grows so wild that guess what? Sometimes it does have to be hedged back so you can get back to seeing the thing, the original thing. That's what the Lutheran Reformation was. It was taking a look at the church as a whole as this big, beautiful, albeit overgrown tree and hedging it back to get to the main thing. Now, during the time of the Reformation, there were radical reformers that wanted to cut the whole tree down and plant a brand new one. And the same is true with the liturgy. There are those in Christianity, mainline American Protestants, evangelicals, charismatics, they want to cut the tree of the liturgy down and replace it. I saw this hilarious picture today of a big ocean-going cruise ship in the background, and in front of it was a dude on a on a, a surfboard, just arm out, just with an umbrella, just having the time of his life. And it said the the big boat was called the Ancient Church, and the dude with his self made parasail was called you know modern day Christians. <laughs> it might be fun, but I'd like to see it weather a storm. Is all I'm saying. So that's why I want to talk about this alternate alternate hymn of praise because given the choice between singing the Gloria in excelsis and singing worthy is Christ I would rather sing worthy is Christ and that's exactly why I need the historic liturgy of the church I need church discipline I need to understand my heritage to rein me in because worship isn't about me and I need to go to church on Sunday content to sing what we traditionally sing which is the Gloria in excelsis so but this, this is what liturgy, the, the worthy is the lamb, is what liturgy looks like when it's living and active. And Lutherans, don't mishear me on this one. Because I'm not saying what you want me to say. So hear only the words that are coming out of my mouth. It's okay for the liturgy to grow and to change. So long as it remains a branch of the original tree and it still gives the same fruit. It's okay. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to get rid of the pipe organ, we need to get rid of the choir, and we need to get all sorts of drums and guitars and all sorts of crazy crap up front and get us a praise band and get ourselves the godly goose pimples. That's not what I'm saying. It's okay for the tree to grow. It's not okay for us to cut down the tree and replant it. Boomers, looking at you. I want my church back. But let's dive into... My mustache is itchy. Let's dive into this worthy as Christ. So uh, it starts out, this is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. That's the refrain that rings through this whole song. Worthy is Christ, the lamb who was slain whose blood set us free to be people of God. And we sing the refrain. Power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor, blessing, and glory are his. The refrain. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. The refrain. For the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia. This is the feast of victory for our God. 
Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And like I said, you want to wake up a frigid Lutheran? Sing this alternate hymn of praise. This, this hymn of praise that the church has in her arsenal now for only, I don't know, a hundred out of 2,000 years of her history. But that's okay. See, new is okay as long as it's a fruit of the same vine. It's a new fruit, sure, but it's a fruit of the same vine. And what, speaking of fruit of the vine, what this hymn is confessing is why we are here. This is why we are here. We have gone to church. We have done our entrance hymn. We have done our confession and received the absolution. We have heard the word of the Lord that is the theme of the day. We have cried out to the Lord again for mercy. Are you sensing a, a pattern here, a common, a conversation started by God, the Holy Spirit, who brought us into church that day, instituted or initiated by God. And then once we realize we're in the presence of God, all we can do is fall to our knees and confess. We hear God's word. We cry out for mercy again. And having received that mercy, we sing out in praise. And the alternate hymn of praise, Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain, starts us off in the right direction. This is the feast of victory for our God. This is the feast. That's why we're here. Christians, I hate to say it, if you're not going to church to receive the word and the sacrament of the altar, why are you even going? Jesus said, do this as often as you do this. And the ancient church did it all the time. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. So, the, the 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 Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the the victory feast, the marriage feast of the Lamb in His kingdom, as as is revealed to us in the Book of Revelation, which is where the lyrics come from, Revelation five and Revelation nineteen are where the lyrics to this hymn of praise come from. That's why I say our our liturgy is biblical because it's literally the Bible. Ninety nine percent of our liturgy is just direct quotations of Scripture, and that's why I think. Here's another thing we can tell our children about the liturgy when they ask. Our liturgy is a dim reflection of the actual liturgy that is happening in heaven. We, we see the, the, the liturgy, we see worship in heaven all throughout the scripture, in, in the Old Testament and in the New and especially in the book of Revelation. And... I know the book of Revelation is like, you know, this check the box book of this happened, this happened, this happened. Now Jesus is coming. That's not true, actually. Um, it's a kind of a behind the scenes book. It's, it's John's first attempt at writing a gospel and he wrote it in code because he was imprisoned and he had to get it to the Christians without the Romans going, this is about Jesus. So he wrote it in code. Which, it, amazing code. Go read Revelation chapter 5, which is where the, the, a lot of the lyrics for this hymn of praise come from. And you see the angel telling him, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. And John looks and he sees a lamb. Yeah. <laughs> but always a lamb looking as though it had been slain. Christ is never removed. Even the risen Christ is never removed from his crucifixion. And so we sing, this is the feast of victory for our God. And it, it is that feast. It is God taking what is happening in eternity, which is outside of time and space. So it doesn't apply to the linear way we think of, of you know, beginning and end. It's outside of time and space. That future for us of paradise promised, he takes it, rips it out of eternity and hands it to us in time and space in worship in the Lord's Supper. He takes that actual marriage feast and he gives it to us in simple bread and humble wine. He gives us the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which was given and shed for us and for the forgiveness of our sins. It's important to think when we're in church, we are beckoned back to the Garden of Eden. You see, Adam and Eve were barred from the Garden of Eden, in which was the tree of life. You see, God in the beginning promised, if you eat the fruit of this tree, you will never die. And God put the angel with the flaming sword outside of Eden after he banished Adam and Eve to bar them from the tree of life. But now, for us, for Christians, the second Adam has made the cross 
a life-giving tree. And when we enter in, back into the very real presence of God, when we go to worship, we get to actually eat the fruit of the tree of life. We get to eat that which was on the cross. And now this is, of course, sacramental eating, not, you know, nom, 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 nom. We're, it, it's a... <laughs> Yes, it goes into our mouth, we digest it. But it's not it's not th- like not that kind of eating. I don't know how to describe sacramental eating, but we get to eat the fruit of the tree of life and whoever eats the fruit of the tree of life will not die. Oh sure, this flesh is going to fail and my breath is going to stop and my heart will cease to beat, but I will not die. As, as Job said, if the worms destroy my, my body, in my flesh I shall see God. Those of us who have eaten from the fruit of the tree of life, Christ himself, his body and his blood, will be raised up on the last day because Christ dwells in us. So the alternate hymn of praise, Worthy is Christ the Lamb, is filled with so much riches and so much goodness that in spite of ourselves, we Lutherans can't not burst this song out every time we sing it. Even in, even in my home church, on the rare occasions where we get to sing this one, it's like the congregation is like, oh, look at you guys, you woke up. Wow, welcome back to the liturgy. Hey, the old liturgy is good too. You should have that much enthusiasm. So let's do a little bit on some of the lyrics and we'll let this one go. And then next time we pick up Liturgy 101, we'll talk about the glory in Excelsis, which is the common one, the one we should be doing more often. This alternate hymn of praise really is a special occasion kind of a thing. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, never removed from his crucifixion, whose blood set us free to be people of God. No decision theology here. No, it is the blood of Christ that has set us free and made us people of God. Power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor, and blessing, and glory are his. Whose? This Lamb who has been slain. What is power? It is Christ on the cross. What is riches? It is Christ on the cross. What is wisdom? What is strength? It is Christ on the cross. Honor, Christ on the cross. Blessing, Christ on the cross. Glory, Christ on the cross. As a matter of fact, the New Testament refers to that as the son, that crucifixion as the Son of Man being glorified. And anyone from the ancient days who heard, uh, like John the Baptist would say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's not a cute, cuddly, little, woolly lamb that we want to snuggle up with. No, that lamb going to die. And that's how the people understood that. They are going to slaughter that lamb. That's what Lamb of God means when a Lamb of God is going to take away the sins of the world. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. We can boldly say that because we get this directly from Scripture. All of creation, every race, every color, every creed is going to be in... I wonder... Do I really mean that when I say every creed? Well, everyone who confesses the three ecumenical creeds, let's put it that way. But every race, every tribe, every people group, regardless of anything physical that might seem to divide us these days, all who stand before the throne are going to sing this song. And how do we know? Because this song comes to us from the book of Revelation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the Lamb forever. And this one, let's just put... End times, the bad end times theology behind us. For the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia. That's right. And this one troubled me when I was big into the Left Behind books. What do you, the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. What do you mean Christ is reigning now? God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has always been ruling, has always been reigning, has always been sovereign, has always been in charge. But this reign of Christ, this thousand-year reign of Christ, is when he rules in the hearts of his believers, when he rules his church militant. This, we are the church militant. because, Well, as the, um, when uh, Jesus said, against my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail, the charge was not hell against the church. The charge was the church against hell. And against this church, the gates of hell, shall not prevail. That is why in this time we are the church militant, but worthy is the Lamb is a hymn of praise of the church triumphant. 
It is God giving a future promise to us right now. And it is an example. It's only a hundred years old out of 2,000 years. It's an example of how liturgy can and does change over time and how that's okay. How many Lutherans does it take to change a light bulb? Just one crazy liberal one and the rest of us all stand there with our arms crossed saying we like the old light bulb better. I get it. I get it. As long as it's a branch of the same tree and it still gives that same fruit, it's okay for the liturgy to grow. And this is a beautiful, wonderful example of how the liturgy very recently in the lifetime of maybe many of you watching this, not my lifetime, I was born in the 80s, not the 70s, but in how in our lifetime, the liturgy has given us this amazing gift, such an amazing gift. Lutherans, we're not the only ones that sing this. Uh, Catholics sing it, Presbyterians sing it as a hymn, albeit not, not a piece of the liturgy itself, but this is a, a, a piece of the Lutheran liturgy that has been gifted to all of Christendom. So if you take nothing else away from this series so far, it's that there's a reason we do what we do. And we do what we do because of what it confesses about what we believe. And it's what we do because it's how God chooses to deal with us. God does not deem to deal with mankind in any other way outside of his word and his sacraments. And that's why we go to worship on Sunday to participate in the historic liturgy of the one true Christian church, the faith, which has been once and for all delivered to us, the saints. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.